Almighty. Yeah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. All right, sit down if you can. <laughs> all right, all right. Yes, yeah, thank you guys. That is so awesome, and I appreciate every effort that you guys do all the time, and I know everybody else does, and uh, we've had people online say, man, that's just great, and um, I know if you can capture something live, even close online with an experience, that's quite an accomplishment, and you guys uh, do great in our media room, and all, man, you guys just work miracles and do great things and help all of us to be blessed in life, and uh, we appreciate every drop of that. You know, I know all of you guys know, but some of you need to know that every person um, here, we have one staff member that uh, helps us with a lot of different things, all kind of different things, and that's it. And Pastor Tanya and I are the only, uh, only paid staff. We have one other paid staff member that's paid very, very small amount of money to help us with some other things. And everybody else you see is volunteer. I mean, they completely give of themselves with no uh, strings attached, and they've been so faithful. They're here all the time. They're at everything. And God, I just love them, and, and I know that you guys appreciate all that. And I, I, you know, I can't say enough good things about them, and I hate to, I hate to just save it all up, you know, for some appropriate time. Uh, I like to try to tell folks uh, when it happens how much you bless my life, and, and they certainly do. Well, as I started preaching at the, at the welcome to this church service today, I've got a, uh, I hope it'll be a treat for you because I know that some of you have been through with our journey classes and our school of leaders classes, which I don't think we've had any of those for at least the past three or four years uh, that we've had any of them. And I know some of you guys that are here now with us at church and certainly you guys watching online um, have never been through any of those. Uh, you don't even really know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's like, what, Pastor? What did you used to do? Well, we used to do a, we used to do a lot of things pre-COVID and all of that kind of stuff, and uh, and that now is you know we've just uh, not moved back into yet, and um, and yet the the principles there are valuable, tremendously valuable, and. Uh, it's a shame that many times, you know, you have things that are a great blessing in people's lives and, you know, after a while, you just really just move on past and you never come back to any of those things that have really made you the person that you are. Uh, I, I know people say, Pastor Keith, you know, you, you know, you've been with the Lord for 50 years, uh, you've been uh, pastoring, you've been doing all kinds of uh, work, mission work and, and, and evangelism work and pastoral work and, and music work and every kind of work. Um, you know, how, 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 do you, how do you be like that? Well, it's those things that the Lord does in your life that, that grows you that way, that produces uh, discipline in your life and understanding and and motivates you and, and moves you to be the person you are and to continue uh, growing and maturing. And so it's, it's principles that you learn. It's things that impact your life. This is one of those things I mentioned earlier that uh, the, the study, Experiencing God, was written by Henry Black, uh, Blackby, Blackaby and Claude King, and it was a manual, and it took six months to get through it. The study lasted six months. Now, can you imagine studying something that every week you got in the study that you were going to have to be there every week for six months, and you had to do homework, and you had to do the manual, and you had to study, and you had to do all these things? This is the kind of things we did back in the early 1990s and, in the, and on the home up. And I'm thinking now, Lord, we can't get people together for six days, much less six months worth of time. Sure can't get them to do any homework or anything like that. But over the years, from that time until now, this made such a tremendous impact in my life that I said, you know, we need to put this in some kind of format that can, we can all experience this. Uh, not taking six months or, or having manuals and workbooks and all that kind of stuff, but we certainly don't need to just forget about this tremendous uh, uh, method, these tremendous uh, realities that can help all of our lives in the pursuit of, of everything we want in life because 
Uh, we all have desires concerning our relationship with the Lord, don't we? I mean, we, we, we all want to hear his voice. We all want to feel his presence. You know, we, we, we all want to know his will. We all want to experience his power. Well, the only reliable source that we have to tell us whether this is even possible or not is the word of God. And in the word of God, the Bible tells us about how we go about experiencing the reality of God in our life. This is the way the Bible describes God's work with us. When God gets ready to do something, he always reveals it to a person or in the Old Testament to his people uh, before he does it and he invites them to come and get involved with him in what he's doing on this earth. And there are three basic similarities in all of the men and women in the Bible that God used to do anything that was his purpose. And here are the three similarities. Number one, when God spoke, they knew it was God. Number two, they knew what God was saying. And number three, they knew what they should do in response to what God was saying. So God accomplished his work through his people. And the Bible is designed to help us understand the ways of God so that when we see God working, we will recognize that it's God. And we need this. Why? Because right now, God is working all around you. And God is working not only around you, but God is working in you. And, and one of the greatest tragedies of the Christian life is that while we have this deep longing to experience God, we are experiencing God. Moment by moment, we are. And day by day, certainly we are experiencing God and we just don't know how to recognize him. So we lose the motivation. We lose the uh, essence. We lose the, uh, the, the juice of the Christian life because we hear people give testimonies about God said this and God moved me that way and I heard God say this and God used me to do that and I wanted to go. And, and we just hear all kinds of wonderful testimonies about how God uses somebody and we sit there and say, well, why doesn't he ever use me? Why can't I ever have an experience like that? And you think of, you begin to beat yourself up and the devil begins to encourage you and accuse you and slander you as you're not, you're not qualified. God doesn't care about using you. He uses other people, but he doesn't use you because you're substandard somehow. Well, I've got some good news for you. That is just simply not the truth. And if you ever read the Bible, you'll know what I'm talking about because everybody God used in the Bible seems to be uh, questionable. <laughs> I mean, not a one of them. Uh, the greatest thing about the Bible is that it doesn't hide the flaws of its heroes. It tells you everything <laughs> about all of them. And many of them we wouldn't even want to live next door to. They moved in the community, we'd move out. Yeah, and God still used them. See, God's not nearly as picky as we are. Uh, anyway, it's a whole nother message. Let me give you, let me give you the seven realities of experiencing God. Now, these are not um, ironclad, you know, truths, theologies. These are just some principles that as you read the Bible, you see God working in this way in the lives of the people that he uses in the Bible. So these are like seven hooks, if you want to picture them that way, over on that wall for you to hang your, your understanding of how to experience God on. All right, so here's number one. This used to be number two, but I think it's number one. The first reality is God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. God pursues this love relationship with you because that's why you were created. 
God created you and me because he wanted to have a love relationship with us. This is the most important truth in knowing God or experiencing God. And that is, if your love relationship is right with God, then you at least have the possibility for everything else to be right with God. But if your love relationship with God is not right, nothing else can be right in your experience with God life. And there are two passages in the Bible that tell us what God wants most of all. One of them is an Old Testament passage. It's in Deuteronomy chapter six. Deuteronomy is a book. Deuteronomy, the name of the book means second numbering. I know that's exciting to you, but it just says that there was a first numbering and something happened and now he has to come back and do it again. Well, you know what happened. Moses brings the laws down off the mountain, tablets of stone. Israel goes to Kadesh Barnea. Israel decides, we ain't going in there. They're giants in the land. They turn back around and God says, all right, I'm gonna march you around this desert out here until everybody who's 21 years or older who made that decision is dead. So for 40 years, they wander around the wilderness. He brings their children and their grandchildren back up to Kadesh Barnea and he says, okay, what are you gonna do? And they said, Joshua, Joshua was, said, we're going in this time. He said, all right, then this is the most important thing that you need to understand about me. And God tells them the most valuable uh, piece of information that anyone could have. And that is, God, what is it that you want most of all? And here's the one thing he said to them. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 5, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That just means I'm the only God. I am God alone. There are no other gods. I am the only one that is God. Therefore, next verse, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So God says, here's the most important thing I want you to know about. I want you to love me with everything you have. When Jesus comes along in the New Testament and a smart aleck lawyer asks him a question, uh, Jesus, uh, what is the most important commandment of all? And Jesus said this in Mark 12, verse 30. Look at, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So when Jesus was asked, what is the most important thing that God wants humanity to know on this earth? And Jesus said, God wants you to love him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. The same thing that God told him in Deuteronomy. So what can we conclude from these two passages? That more than anything else, God wants us to love him with all that we have our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, our life, our resources, our family, all that we have, God says, I want you to love me with everything you have because that's what I created you for. I want to have a love relationship that's real with real beings. Can we have it? So because of this, God always has to take the initiative. God pursues us. Have you been pursued by God? I'm gonna tell you, if God couldn't run faster than I could, I wouldn't be here. Because I'm telling you, when I was 16 years old, I was running from God as fast as I could go. Because I thought God was mean. I thought God was ugly. I thought God hated me. I thought God was a cosmic killjoy and a party pooper. And I thought God was a God of judgment that wanted to smash me and turn me into a crispy critter. That's 
what I thought God was after and I ran from God with all that I had. And if he couldn't run faster than I did, I would not be here today. I was, I was running off a cliff as fast as I could go. But he is the one who initiates this love relationship. It began, he began by sending Jesus Christ, his son, to this earth to redeem us. And then he further proved it by allowing Jesus to suffer all the inhumanities that he suffered, go into the cross and then die on a cross to make this love relationship possible. He came to Adam and Eve personally. He came to Noah. He came to Abraham and all of his boys, Isaac and Jacob and all of the boys. He came to Moses. He came to the prophets. Jesus came to the disciples. He came to Paul on the road to Damascus and challenged him personally. And the reason why is because in our human state, none of us will intentionally pursue God. It's not human nature. So if God is going to have a relationship with us, it's always God who takes the initiative. And we can't even know the activity of God unless God takes the initiative to show us his activity. This love relationship with God is real and personal. You can't love someone without someone else to love. I mean, a love relationship with God takes place between two real beings. I mean, this is, you can't love a cosmos. There has to be a someone personal that you love. When you read the scripture, do you, do you sense that God became real and personal to the people that you're reading about in the scripture? When you read the story of Adam and Eve, do you get the sense that God had a real, personal relationship with Adam and Eve? I mean, what, was God personal to Noah? Did, did, did God have a relationship with Abraham when he called him out of Ur or Moses sitting by a burning bush out in the middle of the desert somewhere or David or Isaiah or Daniel? Did he ever get personal with the disciples? If we ask the early church or the apostle Paul, hey, is this relationship you have with this God you're talking about, is it real and personal? And they would say, yes, yeah, it is. And then my question is, well, has God changed? He doesn't get personal anymore? No, because Hebrews 8 tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the relationship that God pursues us with is something that is real and it's personal and it's practical. Did you know everything God did in the Bible with other people is practical? He did it for a practical purpose. Quail and manna and water in the desert was practical to keep them alive. Feeding 5,000 people on a mountainside was practical. They were starving. And everything God does in life is practical. So the whole plan of the kingdom is, it doesn't work without, without something practical happening in life. So uh, first reality is, God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that's real and personal. You got to know that. He's not out there in the cosmos somewhere. He's, he's here. He's real. He's personal. Not just, not just collective. He doesn't just love us. He loves you personally. Reality number two. God is always at work around you. This is a very interesting statement made by Jesus, and I'm gonna jump on it a little bit more uh, in a minute, but I just wanna read it. Here's what Jesus said in John 5. 
For this reason, this is just after he healed the crippled man at the pool of Bethesda. It's on a Sabbath day. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought to kill him more because he said that God was his father and that made him equal with God. Verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, whatever the father does, the son also does in like manner. For you see, the father loves the son and shows him everything that he himself is doing. And he's gonna show us greater works than these. You ain't seen nothing yet. So Jesus is saying, look, because the father loves me, he shows me everything he's doing. And what I have to do is all I have to do is do what I see him doing. And that's going to be right in the center of his purpose and his will for our life. Because the truth is, God has always been at work. Genesis 1.1, the first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But the fact is, even before the beginning, God has been working. And God will keep on working until the final judgment. So four considerations for God is always at work around me. Just quickly, number one, knowing that God's always at work around me affects my focus. Knowing that it is who that is always working around me, knowing that it is God who is doing the work always around me. Everybody say, not me, but God, that it is God working all around me, takes the focus off of me. It changes my focus. I'm no longer focused on me. I'm focused on him. Let me give you a passage, John 12. Here's what Jesus said. But Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that the only person that he can successfully use to accomplish his purposes through is someone who has died to self-centeredness. As a matter of fact, in order to be saved, I have to die to myself and I have to open up my life to live with God-centeredness in my life. To live a God-centered life, I've got to focus on God's purposes, not my purposes. I've got to be able to step back and look at things from God's perspective and not from the perspective of my old uh, human heart. So look, so this changes our focus in life. Let me, let me just show you what I mean. How many of you have prayed, and I'm, don't raise your hand so I'm not trying to embarrass anybody or, or start a fight, um, how many of you have prayed, God, what is your will for me? I'm gonna tell you, I've prayed that many times. God, what is your will for me? That's not right. This is what I'm talking about. See, you see the focus? When I say, God, what is your will for me? What, where's the focus? It's me. Tell me what you want me to do. So the question is not, God, what is your will for me? The question is, what is your will period, because you're the one that's doing it. You're the one that's working it. The only way I'm going to be involved in it is if you show me what it is that you are doing, because it's your will on this earth that matters. It's not my will on earth that matters. So when God is doing something in the world, he takes the initiative to come and talk to somebody for some divine reason. God has chosen to involve his people in accomplishing his work. Second thought, no, second, second consideration, you never find God asking people to dream up what they want to do for him. Well, let's see, God. I'm sitting down here and I'm praying. 
what is it that I can do for you? Let's see, what can I do? No, you never find God saying something like that. As a matter of fact, here's what God says, John 15, verse five, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. I see, it's not us. <laughs> without the vine, we can't do anything. We don't sit down and dream up what we want to do for God and then invite God to help us accomplish what it is we want to do for God. Because the fact is, it's God who is working in this world. It is God who has a purpose for this world. And it is his purpose that determines the ultimate outcome regardless of what we want to do. And we're standing right in the middle of this. I mean, all of this, these things going on around us in this crazy world that we're in, spinning out of control, looking at catastrophe every day, <laughs> unimaginable catastrophe. You can't believe it could get worse, but it does. Who's doing that? Well, it's not Putin and it's not Iran and it's not uh, Biden and it's not Trump and it's not uh, Colin Powell or any of the other people, uh, Joint Chiefs or any of those other guys, not Israel. Who's doing all of this? It's God's purpose. And no matter what we want to do about it, we do not alter God's purpose. He is the one who is at work and his purpose will ultimately trump everything. I mean, look, what was God doing when he came to Noah about building an ark? Well, he was preparing to destroy the world, right? What, what, what was God doing when he came to Abraham and said, you better get Lot and his wife and family out of Sodom and Gomorrah down there? Well, what was God doing? He was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, what was he doing when he talked to Gideon down in that threshing floor hole in the ground uh, when Gideon was down there uh, scared to death of the Midianites? What did, he, what did, what did God, God said, come on up, Gideon. I'm about, to, I'm about to deliver Israel from the Midianites and I'm gonna use you, oh mighty man of valor. <laughs> Who, me? Uh, what was God doing when he spoke, when he knocked Saul off the back of that donkey on the Damascus road and changed his name to Paul? He was about to reach the world of the Gentiles. See, it's all about what God is doing. So the most important factor in each situation was not what was Noah doing, what was Moses doing, what was Abraham doing, what was Gideon. No, the most important factor in all of those cases is what was God doing? Because God was about to do something and he spoke. The third consideration now, I'm gonna have to really get through this one real quick. Uh, there are some things that only God can do. One of the big questions that you'll have as we go on with some of these other realities and they all just go build on each other is, all right, how can I know that it's God who's doing something in a situation? I mean, uh, I'm gonna have to see where God's working and I'm gonna have to join him. So how do I know God's doing something? How do I know it's just not me, you know, dreaming up? Well, because there are some things only God can do. And if you see these things happening, you know it's God because no one else can do this except God. And here they are. Number one, God draws people to himself. Only God can draw people to himself. Uh, you can't just get saved anytime you want to. I know people think this. They think, hey, I, you know, I'm feeling convicted a little and I think I need to give my life to the Lord, but you know, I got plenty of time. Uh, I'll do it next week. Now, the only way you can come to the Lord is when he draws you, and if he stops drawing you, you will never come to him. Look at this, I'll show you, Mark, John 6. No man, this is Jesus talking, no man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. 
So what does that mean? It means if you have a neighbor, if you have a friend, if you have a family member that comes to you and all of a sudden starts talking about spiritual things. Well, you know, you know, I've been thinking a lot about what's been going on really in my life. And you know, I don't, so, I don't, man, I'm starting to feel funny about this. And I don't think my life is going in the right direction. And I, you know, it just bothers me about, ding, 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 ding. God's God. God's working right there. There he is. And he just showed you he's working. So, and I'm getting ahead of myself. That's your invitation. Get on in there. What do I say? Whatever it is that's in your mind. Well, I don't know the four spiritual laws. I don't know the Roman road. Just say what is in your heart because God's going to put it there. He said, don't worry about what you're going to say when you come before kings. I'll give you what to say. The reason he invited you is because they need your story, not my story. If they needed my story, he would have invited me. But he invites you because they need you, not me. I'm much more professional. I know all the passages. I know all the uh, stories. I know all of the theologies of everything. But they don't need that. They just need somebody that cares about them and is just like them and somebody they respect. And that happens to be you. So you're invited. Second thing only God can do. Only God can cause people to seek after him. By seeking after him, I mean keep following him. I mean want to go with him, moving, moving with him. Only God can do that. You can't create that hunger in somebody else. Only God can do that. Let me show you a passage, John 14, verse 15 through 17. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter that he might abide with you forever the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. So when Jesus Christ comes into your life, he places part of himself called the Holy Spirit in you that pursues God, that pursues truth that pursues reality and it's on the inside of you and it draws you to seek God. Only God can do that. You can't do that. So when you see that happening, you know it's God. Number three, God reveals spiritual truth. Here it is in John 14. But the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Here's a fact. Truth is not discovered. Truth is revealed. And when God gets ready for you to have a truth, he will reveal that truth to you. The Holy Spirit that is on the inside of you, that is the spirit of truth and that teaches you all things and puts you in remembrance of all things will reveal to you the truth that God wants you to understand. How many of you have read passages of scripture just bunches of time and, and understood it and said, that's a good scripture and that's comforting. And, blah. and then all of a sudden, somewhere down the line, you look at that passage and it just bursts forth with all this something that you've never even seen before. It's like, my goodness, man, how could I have read that 10 times and never seen that before? It's ridiculous. Or cause you to end and some pastor or some teacher or maybe somebody sitting beside you on a seat in church just says, hey, you know, have you ever thought about that? And it's like, boom, wow, good night. That's because God reveals truth. You don't discover it, God reveals it. Fourth thing only God can do, God convicts the world of guilt regarding sin. John 16, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is verse seven and eight. It is to your advantage that I go away, for I, if I do not go away, the comforter will not come to you but if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Have you ever tried to make anybody feel guilty because they are a sinner? 
Have you ever tried to convince them how wicked they are, how evil they are, and how much they need a savior? Have you tried to throw a guilt trip on them? Did it work? Negatory. It doesn't work. You know why? Because only God can make someone feel guilty for the sin that they live in. You can make them mad, but God can, can, can touch them and prick them, and they will respond to the guilt that they feel because of the sin that's involved in their life. And God is the only one who can do that. Here's the fifth thing that God, only God can do. God convicts the world of righteousness. Righteousness just means right standing with him. It just means rightness. <laughs> if you're not right, you don't have any rightness. Yeah, only God can make someone who is not righteous sense the fact that he is not righteous and he is not right and that there's a problem that he's not right or a saved person who's living out of his purpose and has gone astray in some way, it's the Holy Spirit that can make him say, you know, man, I'm so far from where I need to be. How, how did I get this far, God? I, only God can do that. Again, you can make them mad by pointing this out to them, but only God can convict the world of whether they're right or not. And then the last one is God convicts of judgment. Only God can convict someone that there is a judgment out there in the future. Now, I know we talk to people all the time about it. We, you know, we try to uh, tell them the stories. We try to paint the picture so they'll know it's a horrible thing out there and you don't want to go there. But only God can make someone have a sense within themselves that judgment is out there and that's something they need to be concerned about. I'll guarantee you, if you've ever heard someone, if you had a friend, family member, an acquaintance, whatever, somebody you met at a gas station, walked up to you at a gas pump, said, you know, I've been thinking about this. This whole crazy world's about to spin out of control, isn't it? Ding, 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 ding. Who made him feel that way? God. That's God working. You know, one of these days, there's gonna be a payday, isn't it? Ding, 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 ding. That's God. Because only God can convict someone of judgment to come. So what are these teaching us? Uh, they're teaching us that God is always at work around us and it's he who works and not we who works. All right. Should I give them the third one? Yeah, let's get the third one real quick. There's seven of them. I'm getting, I, I promise you, I'll move on. All right, I'm gonna have to skip over some stuff, Nay. So just go on to reality number three. You see it? Reality number three, God invites you to join him in what he is doing. God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that's real and personal. God is always at work around you. There's never a time where God is not working around you. And God invites you to join him in what he is doing. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, this is Jesus speaking, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and reveal myself to him. Jesus says, because he loves you so much, that he wants to show you what he's doing and he wants to invite you to come do it with him. God takes the initiative to involve people in his work. Look at Amos. I bet you hadn't been to Amos in a long time. Amos chapter three, look at what it says. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants prophets. Because God loves us, he wants to involve us. He invites us to go to work with him. Why does he invite us to go to work with him? So that we can get personal with him. We can see him in a greater way. And we can be drawn to love him more than we do. Have any of you ever been to work with your daddy? 
Has your father ever taken you to work? I mean talking about your earthly father or somebody that means a lot to you. Man, my dad was a route salesman in Meridian, Mississippi on a drink, on, on, a, on a soft drink truck. And some afternoons, he would come by and he would get me. And I'd climb up in that big truck over those diesel tanks and stuff and hear those air brakes, and be sitting by my daddy. And we'd go down to a store that needed some, some of the product and he would get out and start meeting the guy and then I would go around and start getting the empties because back then, you know, they didn't have cans and all. You had to pick the empties up and get all yours separated from everybody else's. And I'd load them on the truck and then I'd come in there and my daddy would, when my daddy saw me come in the door, he'd say to that store owner, he'd say, hey, here, I want you to meet my son, Keith. Keith, come in. I want you to meet, I want you to, this is Miss Smith. Hi, Miss Smith. You know what that said to me? My daddy's proud of me. My daddy wants people to know I'm his son. My daddy, my daddy wants this guy to know that that hardworking little fellow that put all that out there, that that's his son and he's proud of him. See, that, what does that do? Makes me love my father more. Makes me respect my father more. Makes me see my father in a different light. God invites you. He could do everything by himself. He doesn't need you. He chooses to involve you because he loves you so much. He wants you to have that relationship. And if he can get you working with him, he can show you all these things about himself that you'll never see at any other time. And he can be personal and intimate with you. So what happens when God's about to do something, he takes the initiative to come to one or more of his servants and let them know what he's about to do. And then he invites them to adjust their lives because you're probably already doing something. So when you see him doing something, that's your invitation. He, look, he's not gonna show you something just so you can know it. If he shows you something, he's inviting you to something. When you see it, that's your invitation. Look, you don't have to say, wait a minute. Uh, let me go pray about this. Uh, yeah, is this, is this your will, God? Because by the time you get through praying about it, the situation or the opportunity is probably passed. You don't have to pray about it. God's doing it. He's the only one that can do it. And he lets you see it so you would come with him. <laughs> it's just really that, that simple in life. God's revelation is your invitation to join him. Is it possible for God to be working around you and you not know it? Why, well, sure it is. Bible's full, full of people that God was all around them. I'm just gonna read one because I like it real good. I promise, just one. This is in 2 Kings 16, and this is Elisha, Sha, and his little uh, servant, and his little servant, they're at a city named Dothan, and there's a, they're surrounded by the enemy, and the little servant guy comes running into Elisha and says, Elisha, there's the enemies all around us and uh, we're gonna be destroyed. And here's what Elisha says to him. 2 Kings 6, verse 16. So he answered, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened his eye, the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. See, God opened your eyes. When he opens your eyes so you can see, that's an invitation for you to join him because when he speaks to you, he is prepared to accomplish something in life. I mean, when God shows you what he's doing, he shows you what he's doing because he is prepared to accomplish his purposes at that moment. Now, keep in mind, you, he may be inviting you into a long-term situation. Everything doesn't happen in the flash, in the twinkling of an eye. I'll just remind you that when God spoke to Abram before he became Abraham, when God spoke to Abram, it was 25 years later that his first son, first son of promise was actually born in life. So 25 years is a pretty long-term situation. 
So it doesn't mean that everything's gonna happen, you know, bim, bam, boom, right there quick. It just means that God is about to accomplish. He's working in this situation. He needs somebody to work with him. You've got the right testimony. You've got the right personality. You've got the right skill set. You've got the right look about you. You've got the right compassion in your heart. You've got the right relationship with them. They respect you. You, uh, some for some reason, you may uniquely be capable of working with God in this situation to bring this to the accomplished result of his purpose. And not only with people, with all kinds of situations. It doesn't have to be about a person. I mean, it, God does all kinds of things. And he invites you. And as I mentioned, if he ever uses you, and you know it, and you'll know it, when he invites you, you see him, you say, this is God. Because he, nobody else could do this but God. And then you just kind of get in there a little bit and before you know it, it's like God has done something and you go, you walk away going, man, I can't believe that. Good night. Honey, let me tell you what happened today. <laughs> Woo. And you'll never forget it. See, this is an experience with God. This is not a prelude to an experience with God. This is an experience with God. When God speaks to you, that is an experience with God. <laughs> wouldn't you be silly to say? I mean, wouldn't the, wouldn't the disciples be silly to say, you know, I wish that we could have some experiences with God like other people do. No, they're walking with God. They're experiencing him every moment of every day. And you are too. You just got to learn to recognize it. All right, bow your head with me. That's the first three. There are four more. The fourth one is a long one all by itself, so we'll probably look at it next week all by itself. But we'll move on through. Um, has this been helpful, by the way? I mean, is this saying anything to anybody? You guys out there, shake your head. Okay. I see that camera move, yeah. Good, good. I hope it has. Uh, it's real stuff now, real stuff. All right. All right.